Morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2016 shareholder meeting for Sandstorm Gold. And as I think everybody here knows, my name is Nolan Watson. I'm CEO of the company. And with the consent of those present, I'm going to act as chairman of the meeting. And I'm going to appoint Christine Tact as secretary of the meeting. Uh, Computer Share Investor Services, through its representative Bernadette Villarica, will act as scrutineer for the meeting. Everyone present should have registered with a scrutineer, and if not, would you kindly do so now? And once we've completed the formal part of the business, then David Orm and myself are going to walk you through a bit of an update about Sandstorm Gold. The notice calling the meeting of shareholders and describing the matters to be considered today was mailed on April 29th to all shareholders of record of the company effective April 20th. The declaration of the mailing is available for inspection by any shareholder and it will be retained with the records of the company. Will someone move that the reading of the notice and the statutory declaration be dispensed with? That's a move. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. The preliminary scrutineer's report indicates that the following shareholders are present in person or represented by proxy. So there are a total of 93,511,349 shares, which may be voted at today's meeting held by 460 shareholders present in person or by in, by proxy. This represents approximately 69% of the companies issued in outstanding shares, which I think is a pretty good turnout. On the basis of the foregoing, there is a quorum present, and the final report on attendance will be retained with the records of the company. Notice has been given as required by applicable law, and as a quorum is present, this meeting is properly constituted for the transaction of business. And I've been advised by the scrutineer that the proxies deposited for the meeting have been voted overwhelmingly in favor of all of the matters to be voted on today, and therefore voting is just going to be by a show of hands. In accordance with the articles of the company, I'll be proposing all motions and no seconder is required. Our first item of business is approval of the minutes of the last shareholder meeting held on May 22, 2015. I have a copy of the minutes of the meeting available for inspection by any interested shareholders. Will someone move that the reading of the minutes of the shareholder meeting held on May 22, 2015 be dispensed with and that they be adopted and approved as presented? So moved. All in favor? Opposed? Great. Motion carried. I now place before the meeting the company's audited consolidated financial statements for the fiscal period ended December 31, 2015, together with the auditor's report thereon. These financial statements were mailed to each shareholder who requested a copy and were filed on both CDAR and EDGAR. Will someone move that the reading of the financial statements and the auditor's report be dispensed with? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Our next item of business is fixing the number of directors. Will someone move the fixing of the number of directors of the company at six for the ensuing year? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. Our next item of business is the election of the directors of the company. Management has nominated the following directors. Nolan Watson, David Oram, David DeWitt, Andrew Swarthout, John Badreski, and Mary Little. Will someone move the nomination of these six persons as directors of the company to hold office until the next annual general meeting or until their successors are elected or appointed? I so move. All in favor? Uh, are there any further nominations? No? Is there no further nominations? Will someone move the nominations for the election of directors be closed? I so move. All in favor? Opposed? Oh, someone was fixing their hair. That's, that wasn't a hand. Good. <laughs> Thank you. I declare that the nominations be closed and that the motion has been carried. The next matter is the appointment of the auditors of the company. Will someone move the appointment of Deloitte LLP as auditors of the company until the next annual meeting of shareholders and that the directors be authorized to fix the auditor's remuneration? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. As a bit of a, a housekeeping matter, our audit committee has recently run a process whereby all of the big four firms have, have submitted applications to be the company's auditor for the next year. and, and they're going through that decision-making process in the coming weeks, there will be a, a determination made by the audit committee as to who the auditor will be on a go-forward basis. So that's a, a placeholder for now until that decision's been made. 
The shareholders are being asked to pass two ordinary resolutions today with respect to the company's rolling stock option plan, the full and complete details of which are set out in the circular prepared in connection with this meeting. Firstly, the Toronto Stock Exchange requires that every three years the shareholders approve all unallocated options which may be granted under the company's stock option plan. Secondly, the shareholders are being asked to pass an ordinary resolution ratifying and approving certain housekeeping and other appropriate amendments made by the board to the company's stock option plan, including an amendment which decreases it from a rolling 10% stock option plan to a rolling 8.5% plan. The TSX has conditionally approved these amendments subject to shareholder ratification. Will someone move the adoption of the full text of the shareholder resolution set out on page 47 of the circular, as well as move the adoption of the full text of the resolution set out on page 49 of the circular? I so move. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. As detailed in the circular, the shareholders are being asked to pass an ordinary resolution ratifying and approving certain housekeeping and other appropriate amendments made by the board to the company's restricted share plan including an amendment which increases the number of the company's shares which may be reserved for issuance from Treasury under this plan to a maximum of 3.8 million shares. The TSX has conditionally approved these amendments subject to shareholder ratification. Will someone move the adoption of the full text of the shareholder resolution set out on pages 50 and 51 of the circular ratifying and approving the housekeeping and other amendments to the company's restricted share plan? I so move. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. As detailed in the circular, to reflect current corporate governance best practices, the shareholders are being asked to pass an ordinary resolution to amend section 11.3 of the company's articles to increase the quorum requirements for the company's shareholder meetings to two persons represented, present or represented by proxy, representing not less than 25% of the company's issued shares. Will someone move the adoption of the full text of the shareholder resolution set out on page 51 and 52 of the circular, approving the amendments to section 11.3 of the company's articles? I so move. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. Uh, the shareholders are being asked to pass an ordinary resolution to amend sections 9 and 15 of the company's articles to reflect the current corporate governance best practices and to amend section 24.1 and 24.2 to update and modernize the notice provisions contained in the company's articles. Uh, will someone move the adoption of the full text of the shareholder resolution set out on page 58 and 59 of the circular approving these amendments to the company's articles? I so move. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. And that concludes the formal, super exciting part of the meeting. Okay, so. Dave and I are going to walk you through a presentation of Sandstorm. I'm going to walk through a bit of a high-level overview of the company and, and where we're at today. Dave's going to get into a little bit of the detail of some of the assets, and then I'll come back and finish it off with a bit of financial analysis on the company and talk about where we are going forward. So Sandstorm, we're actually very proud of what we've been able to accomplish over the last year. I remember the AGM in May of last year, we were uh, feeling starting to feel better about where we were getting. The market was still in a challenging position. Uh, we were in full capital allocation mode and we were anticipating buying a number of things at deep values and we did that over the last year and, and so we're here to talk a little bit about that. A cautionary note regarding forward-looking information, we are going to be talking about some forward-looking information in the presentation. Uh, briefly, our independent directors, you can see there we have a very strong board. They are uh, very active, they're proactive, they're very shareholder focused and I think shareholders, this is a, a shareholder meeting and shareholders should be proud of the degree to which they give time and attention and consideration as a company that has to act quickly for transactions. It's one of the things we pride ourselves in. We have a board that is very responsive to being available anytime that we need them. And so it's just another one of our competitive advantages is that board. Uh, our senior technical team is something we're also very proud of over the last few years. We've been building that team and have some of the best technical talent in the industry that does our in-house due diligence for our acquisitions now and as well as our management team. Um, Irfan Kazemi, our CFO, just won CFO of the Year Award for Vancouver, so we're particularly proud of him. And uh, we've continued to grow and strengthen our depth as a management team, um, including this year. A few fun facts about Sandstorm. So we have 131 streams and royalties now, which is a very significant step change from where we were five years ago with maybe 30 streams and royalties. 20 of those streams and royalties are already cash flowing, so our cash flow is more diversified than it's ever been as a company. 
In the last year, 74. That's the number of new streams and royalties we purchased over that last year. 52 of those came in one acquisition with a portfolio that we bought from tech. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. And then 65,000, that's the number of ounces that we have guided for our production for 2019. And compared to a mining company, which has a substantial amount of operating costs and sustaining capital on an ongoing basis, blended between our streams and our royalties, our ongoing cost per ounce is, depending on the quarter, around that $300 per ounce number. So at today's gold price, we're free cash flowing almost $1,000 an ounce. So 65,000 ounces a year represents a substantial amount of free cash flow. One of the things that we love about being a royalty and a streaming company is that it allows us to diversify, not only diversify in terms of our counterparties and assets, but also diversify geographically. Our whole business model is focused and designed to get the upside that you would get if you invested in a mining company like the exploration upside while mitigating a number of the downside risks and obviously a downside risk in the mining industry is is political risk and whereas a mining company has to regularly uh, focus on their operations and therefore they can't necessarily be as diversified because they can't manage 131 projects around the world it doesn't take a lot to operate a stream or any individual royalty and it allows us to have 131 continue to grow that portfolio, continue to grow the geographic diversification of our asset base, and just the more diversified we get, the more stable we get. So if you look at us today, we're about 40% in North America, 40-something percent in South America, and 16% other. So it's a very diverse portfolio today. From a cash flow perspective, this is one of the things that we are particularly proud about, is our, that cash flow, you can see every different color there represents a different stream or royalty with a couple of those just represent other because there are too many to individually articulate. If you look at the bottom portion of those bars, the blue, each of those is a royalty. And a few years ago, we had no cash flow from royalties. So you can see over the last couple of years and, and in the last year in particular, we have added a substantial amount of annual cash flow just from that royalty portfolio. The gold portions above that represent our streams with the green portion at the top representing the amount of streams that we've recently done. So this cash flow is not only diversified, it's growing. We've got a growth profile that we're very proud of. And for the first time in, in the history of the company, and you can see that on this next slide, we have a growth profile between now and the next few years that doesn't require any new mines to be built. So historically, when we were a younger company if going back a few years virtually all of our growth required junior mining companies to build new mines which is obviously a risky proposition today that growth is basically just Yamana building Cerro Moro and in the Yamana contract we have an agreement with them that if they don't build Cerro Moro on time they have to give us uh, ounces from their already operating El Pinon mine so contractually if that mine doesn't get built an already operating mine steps in and delivers those ounces in 2019 and 2020. This is the first time in the history of the company we've been in a position where not only do we have significant cash flow and significant diversification in that cash flow, but the growth profile doesn't require new mines to be built. Having said that, we do believe that because we have 130 streams and royalties and only 20 something of them are included in that previous slide that I showed with cash flow, that there is a significant potential as commodity prices normalize and go higher that new assets will come online that we were not anticipating coming online in those previous production profiles. So whereas in that previous cash flow profile you looked at, it shows our cash flow getting up to around $60 million per year by 2021. If this slide, if the gold price goes to $1,600 an ounce, which is what this slide is based on, you can see that the increase in cash flow just based on that gold price is that first gray bar, which is about $24 million per year. But then we would have the secondary effect of additional mines would likely get built that we're not currently assuming get built. And so we've just tried to articulate a handful of those mines. We've picked four. And if those four mines get built, which we believe they would in a $1,600 gold price environment, that would bring in another $21 million of incremental cash flow. And so we could be in a position where we have $108 million of cash flow as a company just because commodity prices went up a little bit. There's a, a tremendous amount of leverage there. And that's actually one of the things that we have very much been focused on, and you'll see a little bit of this when, when Dave talks in his presentation, but we've been very much focused on getting that 
optionality into the portfolio, buying things that are undervalued today that people aren't giving much credit to but have really have the ability to meaningfully increase our cash flow per share over time. And uh, we're trying to build a company that not only has all of the downside protection mechanisms that you would expect of a streaming company, but that have the upside potential to reward shareholders when commodity prices go higher. One thing that we've been trying to just articulate here over the last couple months to some of our shareholders is the pieces of Sandstorm that we believe are not fully understood by either our shareholders or external counterparties that aren't our shareholders, and the results in us being undervalued or, or having unrecognized value. And so the first part of that is reserve and resource expansion. Most people might not uh, expect this, but in 2015, which is a year where very little exploration was done in the mining industry, it actually happens to be the first year where more ounces were found on sandstorm properties than were mined on sandstorm properties, despite the low expiration expending. So we went through 2015 with more ounces uh, recognized at the end of the year than we had at the beginning of the year, even without having to invest any new capital. And obviously we got the cash flow for the entire year. And that's something that's really starting to take hold in our portfolio as we see that. It's hard to tell on an asset by asset basis which one's going to add reserves and resources and expiration upside during the year, but on a portfolio-wide basis, we're seeing it perform very, very well. Number two is development stage projects. Uh, Dave Orm and I recently had a number of calls with a couple of analysts who, on average, what they're doing when they're valuing our company is they are picking the top 20 or 30 assets, modeling them out, ascribing a value to them, and then saying everything beyond that we're just going to assume is a zero and we'll model it and figure out what the value is later once it matures, which I can understand why they would want to save time, but we know that the other 110 royalties aren't worth zero, they're worth something, and so there's a substantial amount of, of value there. And so if you just take, for example, our development stage projects, we went through our development stage projects that are not included anywhere in that slide six cash flow that we showed you. So the cash flow that goes 50 million going up to 60 million dollars per year. We just took 18 development projects that we have that were not included in there. And we said, what are the resources in those projects? And let's multiply them by Sandstorm's royalty or stream percentage on those projects and see what it adds up to. And it, it turns out that it adds up to another 1.2 million gold equivalent ounces to Sandstorm's credit in the ground, which is a, an in situ value of one and a half billion dollars with US, which it our market cap today is three times our market cap, and that's just in, in assets that are not included in that cash flow. So there's a substantial amount of value there that I think is not being recognized. The third point is expiration acorns. So these are everything below those development projects where we've been investing a million here, two million there, three million there. Most of these we don't actually even announce when we do the transactions and they are having good expiration success. We've got an entire portfolio of expiration assets where a number of those assets are being drilled and they're getting some, some great success. And you'll be seeing those over time coming out in our corporate update press releases, some of those drilling results. And there's, there's a lot of value there that's not being recognized as well. And then finally, uh, rofers and rights to buy back royalties. We have acquired over 30 contracts whereby we either have the right of first refusal to do a stream financing if the company chooses they want to do a stream financing, meaning if they want to do a stream with another company, they have to come to us and we have the option to do the stream on those same terms. And we've been very quietly been going around with junior companies who have projects where there's maybe a 2% NSR owned by somebody else on that project and the mining company or the exploration company has the right to repurchase a certain percentage of that royalty. So might be a contract where someone has a 2% royalty, but they have a right to buy back 1% of that. We've been going around and actually acquiring those buyback rights. So we'll go to the company and say, we'll invest a million dollars in the shares of your company. For a dollar, we would like you to, to assign us all the buyback rights to all of your royalties. So we're sitting on a, a significant number of those buyback rights, which we don't have to exercise them, but if the gold price goes up and the project goes into production, we can exercise a right to maybe pay a million dollars and end up with a royalty that's maybe worth five. And so we're continuing to accumulate that. You won't see it anywhere in analyst valuations. You won't see it 
anywhere in anyone else's valuation as to what our company is worth, but there is a reasonable amount of value that's beginning to be built up in those contracts. So you can see what we're trying to do is create a company that has low risk, that has diversification, strong cash flow, but a lot of upside in the future. Speaking of some of that risk, one of the areas we've been focusing on over the last couple of years, and last year in particular, is counterparty risk and diversification. So if you look at Sandstorm three years ago, 88% of our production was coming from junior mining companies. And that might have actually been a comment that someone say, would say about Sandstorm, which is, oh, Sandstorm, they're the junior mining company streaming a royalty uh, entity. Whereas today, 77% of our production is coming from majors and mid-tiers. And we anticipate by 2019, based solely on the deals that we have already done, that 90% of our production will be coming from majors and mid-tiers. So an absolute paradigm shift with respect to the counterparty profile of the company. And the way that that happened is a couple fold. One is a number of our junior mining companies, counterparties, actually got bought by majors and mid-tiers. So you can see Silvercrest got bought by First Majestic, Trugold recently got bought by Endeavor, uh, so on and so forth. Lakeshore got bought by Tahoe. And, uh, and then on the right, you can see we've also done a number of deals directly and specifically on assets that are operated by larger companies like Rio Tinto, Yamana, Glencore, Ken Ross. And that's how we've been able to change that counterparty profile. So it's a, a very strong counterparty profile that we have today. Very briefly, this is a slide of all of the acquisitions that we made over the last couple of years. And so you can see we've been very busy. We've been saying on our investor calls that we believed that we were closer to a bottom than to a top in terms of the market cycle and that we were busy acquiring things. And this really is the fruit of that. And you can see how acquisitive we have been. We continue to be acquisitive. We've been buying royalties here over the last month or two, and we anticipate continuing to do that over uh, the uh, full 2016 year. Very briefly, before Dave comes up here and talks a little bit about the assets, mm -hmm. we earlier this year completed an acquisition with Tech, and the final purchase price after all the adjustments were made to it was $17 million. And for that, we got 52 royalties. And I tell this to shareholders a number of times, and sometimes you have to see it to fully understand the importance of it. But acting quickly and being flexible is one of our strategic advantages. Our ability to move when there is an opportunity and make intelligent decisions is what allows us to be able to acquire portfolios like this. Uh, you'll see as Dave walks us through a few of the things that were included in that portfolio that $17 million is just truly deep, deep value. And I'd be willing to hazard a guess that if we approach tech today in this market environment with slightly higher commodity prices, or the share price is higher than it was when we did this deal, that these assets would not be for sale. But we were able to acquire them because we, we moved when we did. So with that, I'll bring Dave up and he can talk a little bit about the assets. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Nolan. And thanks, everybody, for, for coming to uh, the meeting today. So, yeah, this I think is uh, a good example of, of what we've been looking for. In the last year and a half, or even in the last two years, the corporate development has focused on all sorts of acquisitions, and clearly it's gotten much cheaper, and it's been cheaper than uh, to acquire assets in that time period than ever before. But of all the uh, assets that have gone down in value, have been cheap to acquire, it's really been a lot of these optionality things. From the tech deal, we were able to acquire, I think, both. Both some, some good assets that are going to cash flow today, uh, cash flow in the short term, but also that deep optionality. And so I'll, uh, I'll spend some time explaining about some of, these, uh, some of these projects. The first one, obviously, I'm not going to go through all 52, but uh, how about just the first three? Uh, uh, we've been talking about Hot Madan quite a bit, and this was really one of the hidden gems in that portfolio that I don't think a lot of people realized uh, when we went and did that acquisition. In fact, to a certain degree, we didn't quite realize how important this asset was. This is a discovery from just early 2015 uh, done by Lydia Made in Chilek. That's a, a Turkish conglomerate company uh, which does a lot of other mining, including uh, being the joint venture partner in Alistair's uh, Chirpler asset. So what we got uh, so excited about this is that with Lydia, with its first drill holes into this, it started intercepting some really remarkable results right from surface. So you can see illustrated on here a, a lot of very broad 
uh, intersects, intercepts of uh, extraordinarily high grade. I think my favorite there is the 71 meters of 32 grams of gold and 1.9% copper. This is a very continuous ore body so far. It's only been drilled, or at least the resource has been established, only on 400 meters of what is 6.6 .6 kilometer strike length of alteration zone. So uh, it, this is something that's continuous. It, they're very excited about it. We're excited about it. We're actually on our way later on this afternoon to uh, take a look at this project in person just to see what it looks like uh, in the flesh and then also see a little bit more about what Maine and Chillick is, is doing on the project. This is some of the reserves and resources just from the first 30 drill holes that they pulled out of it. So already you can see uh, it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable ore body with 5 million tons uh, of indicated grading at 10 grams gold, 2.2% copper. So already they're getting close to, between the indicated and inferred, 2 million ounces of gold plus copper on top of that. Uh, and that's really just the start of this asset. I think another important part of the acquisition is Hackett River. Some of you may be a little bit more familiar with this project. Uh, it was in the hands of Sabina Silver for a number of years, all the way up until when it was acquired by Extrata. Uh, both Sabina and Extrata were doing a, a lot of work on this asset to push it forward, and a lot of studies were done on it. It's located uh, not far from Bathurst Inlet in Nunavut. Uh, it does require a road and a port in order to make it functional, uh, but it is a really high grade uh, silver and um, zinc polymetallic deposit. It's, uh, it, it, it really is one of those remarkable projects, very high grade, uh, large resource, and it's going to be very sought after, I think, by many of the world's zinc producers uh, to get pushed forward. So mm, these numbers of production that you see down below, they're from one of Sabina's reports. Uh, if you, you were to use today's analyst consensus prices, we would be receiving from our 2% NSR uh, $8 million in estimated cash flow. So even if you push this out to a 2030 start date, assuming that it takes that long to get permitted and that long to get the road and port put in place, uh, we would even, uh, I think, uh, uh, conservatively estimate the MPV of this project to be over $35 million. And that's something that we had allocated about $4 million in the total acquisition from tech. So this is uh, something that represents a, a tremendous amount of upside and optionality to us in the, in the future. Another good example of, of what Nolan was talking about is the optionality that we might be receiving from an upside in a gold price is Lobo Marte. So this is one of Kinross's assets in the, uh, the Copiapo belt. It's in between Mericunga and La Coipa. Uh, some of their existing assets as well. This project had a feasibility study put on it. They had started the permitting uh, of it in 2012, but with Kinross's financial problems, they pulled all of that. But it is ready. It's ready to go and uh, receive its detailed engineering. It's ready to enter the, the permitting phase. And for us, uh, it would re represent a, a tremendous amount uh, of cash flow even just from a 1% NSR of something that might produce uh, 350 to 400,000 ounces per year. So as we see the gold price increase, I think when you see it $1,500 per ounce or $1,600 per ounce, if not Kinross, somebody is going to be interested in getting this asset up and going because it does represent uh, one of those uh, very good, high-grade, large assets in, uh, in a good, established uh, producing belt. So really just on to some of the existing and the producing assets right now it's worthwhile giving a, I think a quick update on some of these things so uh, Santa Elena that's one of our first acquisitions in fact it was our very first acquisition along with Arizona in 2009 uh, it has been acquired by First Majestic it's successful, successfully transitioned into an underground operation it's replaced its reserves uh, it's improved its recoveries uh, it's improved its exploration potential. In fact, it sits today at an eight-year mine life, which is the mine life that it had when we first did the deal in 2009. So this, is, I think, is a great success story for us in terms of getting payback on assets but still seeing that huge amount of uh, life of mine going ahead of it. Diavik as well. 
they've done a very good job, even just in the last year, of what is a very mature diamond producing asset. They, they more, than, uh, more than successfully replaced the reserves after our first year of receiving a royalty off of that. So that means we're increasing our uh, expectation by almost 15% of what the original transaction was. And they're advancing the A21 pipe to production as well. Chapada, it's worthwhile mentioning how successful they've been at replacing reserves and how, uh, how much upside we see in the exploration potential of that project itself. Uh, it's one of Yamana's most profitable and uh, uh, best economics of their assets right now. And it has the potential to expand <laughs> substantially in the future. It's worthwhile mentioning assets like Black Fox. Black Fox is, a, is an acquisition we made, and we made our, our payback on it. Primero has struggled on working on this, and they haven't made money off of it, but, but we've made everything that we put into it. And that, again, is another asset that's really getting more life breathed into it. With the Froom Zone emerging, uh, this is really going to change it and uh, change the aspect of it and make it uh, a much more... Uh, a, a much more productive asset over the next coming years uh, as they drive out to it. And in addition to the Froome Zone, they're seeing more duplicates of this, uh, uh, of that Froome Zone uh, even closer to where Black Fox is today. And uh, lastly, I'll, I'll speak about uh, Karma. Karma is another one of those assets that we did with a junior company with the expectation that it deserved to be in the hands of a much larger company. It subsequently has done that, being acquired by Endeavor. It's successfully transitioned into production right now. We're receiving cash flow from our, uh, our royalty, uh, our stream from that. And uh, Endeavor fully expects to convert all its inferred resources into reserves at some point in the future. And they're going to be chasing after the exploration upside that we've always been very, very positive on this, uh, this asset. A few points on uh, some of the development assets uh, that, that's worthwhile talking about, uh, particularly assets that we don't feel that we're really getting any kind of value from the market on. Hugo North is, is one that's worth speaking about now. Uh, both uh, Turquoise Hill and Rio Tinto have uh, approved this underground extension, approved the Black Cave. Uh, even as of this morning, Turquoise Hill has announced that the EPCM contractor has been put in place. They're expecting to start production anywhere from five to seven years from now. And the Hugo North extension uh, is part where we receive our stream from is part of the current mine plan. So uh, I think we only have upside to see from that project. Paul Isnard is, a, is another interesting project. This is one of those assets that we've seen progress from that acorn stage where we first bought the, re, uh, the royalty before there was even a resource established. Today it sits with a PEA completed, uh, with a large uh, company running the project now and funding it in Nordgold. They're pushing it forward to feasibility. They're expecting to get that done by the end of the year. They're filing all their documents for permitting. Uh, and uh, this is an asset that's expected to produce between 270 and 300,000 ounces per year. For, so for us, that's over over uh, $3.3 .3 million in estimated cash flow at $1,200 gold price uh, and upside beyond there on something that we originally spent $5 million on the asset. Uh, the last one I think I'll speak about is Arizona. So, so this is a project uh, that we did the stream on uh, when we originally started the company. We've made all of our money back on this asset. Uh, we've now gone through the restructure as Arizona has closed down and looked to, uh, I think, reignite itself or restart itself as, a, as a, a new type of project. And we're getting closer and closer to realizing that project coming to fruition. Uh, it, this is something that we hold a, a lot of debt on. We have $50 million in debt on the asset. We also own a uh, large royalty stake, or sorry, large equity stake, but we still have royalties on the Arizona main area and the Greenfields area, which have both seen a lot of progress made in the last, uh, in the last even few months, uh, even in the, and I think we'll see a lot of uh, news on this project in the future, which will allow the market and allow investors to really 
realize how much value that we still hold in this project and how much value it can provide to shareholders. I think when you go through all of this, though, it's, uh, this is a very helpful slide in really uh, demonstrating what we've been able to achieve uh, that I don't think any other or many other mining companies at least have been able to achieve at the same time. So over uh, this downturn in the market, you've seen most companies uh, see their share count increase because they've had to uh, issue equity at dilutive prices. They've also had to revise their reserves and resources based on a uh, decrease in commodity prices. So for us though, we've seen something that's quite a bit different. Most companies, I think you'd see a decrease on a per ounce basis, seeing their reserves and resources, whereas even in particular from 2015 to 2016, one of the lowest years in terms of cost and spend, or sorry, spend on exploration, we've seen our reserves and resources per ounce, uh, our ounces per share increase uh, by about 15 or 20 percent. So uh, for us that's something I think we're very proud of because what we're trying to demonstrate and what we're trying to do with all of our acquisitions is to show the value that we're adding on a per share basis. So uh, we're trying to, when we look at acquisitions, we're we're looking, is it going to be accretive on a reserve and resource basis? Is it going to be accretive on a cash flow basis? Is it going to be a accretive on an NAV basis? Uh, we've tried to be, I think, as responsible as possible when directing our acquisitions. And I think a chart like this helps to demonstrate that for us and demonstrate how successful we've been, uh, we've been at achieving that. So I think with that, I will pass it on to Nolan for the last part of the presentation to give an update on financial on the financial uh, status. Thanks, Dave. So this will be quick, but a bit of a financial update. A lot of people want to know the balance sheet. What is our firepower, if you will, for doing future transactions? So we have a revolving line of credit provided by a number of quality banks in Canada. That's $110 million. And we fully drew on that revolver back at the end of last year for the amount of transaction. Since then, we've been paying it down. And today, the debt stands at only $63 million. We actually anticipate by the end of the quarter, it'll be below $60 million. And we continue to pay that off. And you, you can see that in this graph that it's not going to take us that much longer to pay it off. This obviously assumes that we don't do new transactions, which we do anticipate doing new transactions. The dotted line above that you can see is specifically designed to show what is our firepower, what is our ability to allocate capital without having to raise equity because we have that revolving line of credit continuing to be available to us or at least the undrawn portion of it. So for example, over the next year and a bit, by the end of 2017, we could allocate over $100 million without having to raise equity. And specifically looking at that debt repayment schedule, you can see there by the end of 2017, uh, we would be able to have our debt to zero at the rate that we're currently cash flowing. In fact, this is done based on $1,200 gold and gold is higher than that today. So at today's gold prices, we would anticipate paying this off even faster than this chart shows. Uh, and finally, one of the last pieces from a financial perspective that's worth noting is that despite the fact that we have $63 million of debt, we actually have over $70 million of other non-core assets that aren't streams or royalties. So equity investments or debt investments in other companies. The largest piece of the debt investments is the debt that we received back in the Luna restructuring, which over time we plan on monetizing. Uh, and emphasis on all of that is non-core. So over the next five years, we anticipate liquidating all of those investments in that 71 million. It's also worth noting that the interest income we're accruing on those investments is higher than our interest expense on our debt. So we've actually got a positive carry from an earnings perspective just on the interest. So we're in a very, very strong position from a financial perspective. Objectives for this year, uh, we want to be disciplined. We want to continue to pay down debt with our free cash flow like we've discussed. We want to continue to grow. We want to focus on small acquisitions that have a substantial amount of leverage to shareholders. But at the same time, we also want to continue to search for those larger cash flowing, chunkier investments that investors get excited about. And, and that search continues as well. And we want to continue to monetize non-core assets. So 
both the $71 million of equity and debt investments. We're going to continue to monetize that. In fact, we've actually monetized 5% of our equity portfolio this week alone, and we'll continue to be diligent in doing that so that we can continue to allocate capital to, to royalties and streams. And we want to keep uh, growing the company in a disciplined manner, and, and that's why our objective is to continue to build a diversified, world-class precious metals streaming and royalty company. You know, when I reflect at Sandstorm over the last number of years, I can honestly say that today we have a stronger portfolio than we've ever had before. Our counterparty profile is better than it ever has been before. Our assets are more diversified, including geographic diversification than it ever has been before. Our management team is more well-rounded and more experienced than it ever has been before. And so I'm just feeling very good about where the company's headed. We don't know which way the commodity prices are going, but I think either way, whether it goes up or down, we're poised well to succeed, and we're going to continue doing that this year. So thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you. The, the management team and a few of the board members, we're going to stick around here. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask us. And if anybody's watching this online and they have questions, feel free just to phone us in the office. We're happy to answer questions anytime. Have a great day, everyone.